board for getting out and about again to events and meetings. And next Saturday, Ryanair CEO Michael O'Leary will open the gates for the first time in three years of his farm in Westmead to the public for the annual sale of pedigree Angus bulls and heifers from his farm. This week, the IPCC report on climate change was a stark reminder to us all of the need to change our lifestyle in order to avoid the catastrophic consequences of global warming. And of course, that includes how we use transport, including aviation. Well, I've been speaking to Michael O'Leary, and I began by asking him about the long delays of recent weeks for passengers travelling from Dublin Airport. Dublin Airport have held their hands up and said, you know, they've got their recruitment wrong. Uh, it is a little bit more difficult to recruit airport staff at the moment because they have to have specific security clearance. So they're short about 200 security staff and we I think they'll, they'll be able to recruit those over by the next two months. But April and May is going to continue to be problematic. We think the solution is to bring in some army personnel, particularly at weekends, because they can do the pat downs and the call throughs and free up those people to open up all the x-ray machines. In Terminal 1, they've got 15 x-ray machines. Currently, they're only staffing about eight to 10 of those machines. And particularly for the next three weekends, we really need the help of the army because you've got the big annual Hajj of the Easter school holidays and lots of families traveling abroad for Easter. We need uh, security at Dublin Airport to be at maximum capacity. And for that, I think we need help from the army. Do they have the expertise, though, for what is a really important job to keep us all safe? Yeah, the army, are, you know, the army are the most, have the most expertise in security. You know, if you want somebody to kind of uh, manage security or do patting down and calling people through, the army are best in Europe at it, you know, and the European Union would accept that. We think that would be the way to solve the problem. It's a big change from this time 12 months ago or indeed two years ago when the airport was, was completely empty. Are people getting back to flying at the same frequency as they were pre-COVID? They are. I mean, March, Damien, was the first time we carried more passengers. We carried 11.2 million passengers in March compared to 10.9 in March of 2019, which or 2020, which was pre-COVID. They're back. People have been locked up for two years. There's a huge hunger there to travel, both for business and for leisure. And we see a big surge in particularly family travel to the beaches of Europe for the, the two weeks of the Easter holidays. Is that all going to change, though, Michael? Is the, the, the era of the cheap flight coming to an end for a variety of different reasons? I don't think so. I mean, all the indications we, are, we have is that people are going to continue to travel. Air travel, particularly on Ryanair, is low fare, it's affordable. And also, you're now flying on new aircraft, which we've, we're spending about 20 billion with Boeing over the next five years, buying these new MAX aircraft, which have 4% more seats, but they burn 16% less fuel. You know, for all the talk about taxing air travel and the end of air travel, Irish tourism, Irish industry, Irish agriculture needs low cost air access to and from the European Union. But I, I suppose you've seen the IPCC report this week, which tells us that we all really now must change the way we live across the board in terms of what we eat, what we wear, how we travel. Uh, we probably should be using more public transport, we probably should be going on less cruises, and we should be maybe rethinking our flying as well. So don't we have to change our attitude towards flying as part of all of that? I don't think if you're living on an island in the periphery of Europe, you can change your attitude towards aviation. You know, it's fine if you live in Holland or in Belgium and you're at the centre of the European Union. You have alternatives, motorway, uh, rail, if you live in Ireland or in Cyprus or in Portugal or in Greece, you don't have those alternatives. We have to fly. Our tourism industry depends on people flying here. But as an industry, we have to make flying more sustainable. That means new technology aircraft and engines that burn less fuel. And over time, increasing the supply of sustainable aviation fuels so that actually the fuel we're using in our aircraft are sustainable. Now, Ireland has a long way to go on that. Um, but it, I think it beholds all of us whether you're in aviation, in agriculture, we need to do more on solar panels. I think, I mean, I'm looking, we're looking at building sheds now in Jiggenstown where we're going to put solar panels on the sheds and try and reduce our energy demands, both because it's a sensible thing to do, but it's also the environmentally stable thing to do. But maybe instead of taking the three family holidays or the two family holidays or the weekends away, that we cut back maybe one or two of those flights. Do you think that that is going to have to come into our, our way of life now and our way of thinking into the future mm. as a result of reading that report? This no, week? honestly, I don't. I mean, like the real challenge for the world is can we stop the Chinese and the Indians building coal, I mean, it's building these coal burning power stations 
really what the Irish do will have no impact on uh, global uh, or climate change in the next number of years. But that still well, doesn't. Everybody but, yeah, that no, 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 actually, no, no, except that, that still doesn't mean we don't do our part. Yeah. But if we live on an island, I think people have a right to travel. We have the, the whole purpose of the European Union is built on the free movement of people. But we need to make that travel more sustainable and, and less environmentally damaging. And that's why we're using a combination of new aviation, new aircraft technology and sustainable aviation fuels. But it, does that not sound a little bit like make me pure, but not just now, when you say that we continue to build passenger numbers over the next 12 months or so? No, it, it, it is. But, you know, I'm building those passenger numbers on new aircraft that are costing me about $100 million a piece. But those new aircraft means I can carry 4% more passengers per flight but burn 16% less fuel. Okay, you mentioned there about um, the increase in oil price and naturally the horrific events in uh, Ukraine are, are partly, are mainly to blame for that because of R Russia's invasion. There were accusations made that you jacked up prices when refugees yeah. were fleeing and those claims were made by both the Polish ambassador to Ireland and the Ukrainian ambassador to Ireland. W how do you respond to those accusations? Uh, both were completely false. Uh, we followed up with the Polish uh, authorities and found that they read about it on social media and in the Irish newspapers. The Ukrainian embassy got it in the Irish newspapers. Like what happened was the refugees showed up on the first weekend. Most of the flights out of Poland were already fully sold. There was only one or two seats left and as is always the case, they were quoted the highest fares. What we have done, working with both the Ukrainian embassy since, is put in a guarantee of low fares. We have fares available at under 50 euros one way, under 30 euros and under 50 euros one way. We waived passport ID regulations for Ukrainians. We're taking cash payments instead of credit cards. And we're running uh, humanitarian flights to our airports in Romania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, which border Ukraine. So we've done everything it's possible to do to facilitate both refugees coming from Ukraine who want to fly to Ireland and many other points in the EU, EU and also to support our Ukrainian passengers um, during the illegal invasion. I know, but, but do you not accept that there may have been indeed many cases where refugees were, were charged exorbitant prices? No. There's no such thing as an exorbitant price on Ryanair. Uh, there were very there were very few seats left on the first weekend. Yes, some people were, but they paid what were was the available or the lowest available fare. In all cases, it was about one third of the fares being charged by Lufthansa, KLM, or Austrian Airlines. And immediately following the invasion, we put in place a series of low of low cost one way airfares under fifty euros, which are have been taken up by thousands of Ukrainian citizens fleeing Ukraine and reuniting with families all over Europe. Everything we can do, we're doing, but the idea that we jacked up fares for Ukrainian citizens in the first couple of days of the invasion is simply false. Never happened, wouldn't happen, and didn't happen. Okay, and it would be outrageous if that did happen in the minds of so many people that are mm -hmm. digging deep at the moment to open more. their doors to Ukrainians and, and to raise money for them. I mean, at the very least for yourselves and the other big airlines, could you not be maybe offering sort of charter flights from Eastern Europe to safer havens in, in Western Europe or, or doing that little bit more rather than just offering low fares? We see the, the difficulty is we're into the summer schedule, so we don't have any spare aircraft now. To run a charter flight to Ukraine, it flies empty one way. And, and the reality is we're, we're, I think we operate something like about 40 daily flights from airports in Poland, Hungary, uh, Romania and um, Slovakia. To points not just in Ireland but all over Europe. So there's a huge amount of flights already there. As a result of the Ukrainian invasion, bookings into those airports have kind of declined and that's created more space for uh, refugees who now want to travel elsewhere in Europe. And thankfully, in certainly over the first week or two, there was a backlog of people who were looking to fly. Now there's very little, I mean, there's no kind of, nobody's not served we have available seats, and we have available seats at low fares. And I think that's the most important service we can provide. Ukraine was a big market for us. We have 2 million passengers, and we want to look after them and their families during this time. But we did not and would not raise prices uh, during a war or on fleeing uh, or, or people who are fleeing a, a war. And um, have you been asked by the Ukrainian government or by the Irish government to try and help out in any way, shape, oh, yeah, or form? Yeah, I mean, they want to know why we don't offer free seats. They so, say, well, we can't offer free seats on flights from Poland. There's no way of separating them. But we are offering, we're taking humanitarian aid. We've now run about 24 uh, flights back into those countries where we're taking medical food supplies, medical supplies free of charge in the whole of the aircraft. We're guaranteeing low fares, exit fares from the, on those routes, and we're doing everything else we can, both waiving credit card fees and waiving, in some cases, they've arrived with no passport or IDs. Now, 
where countries like Ireland have played a blinder is they waive the kind of passport requirements for fleeing Ukrainians. We waive them straight away. As long as the country of arrival allows us to do that, then we ignore the kind of absence of photo ID or anything else. It, you know, when we talk about Ukraine, it's very difficult to talk about anything else. It almost seems seems trite. But life must go on, and we've just come out of two years of, of COVID. On the farming front, I read in The Independent this mm. week where you've actually expanded your enterprise. You've gone into tillage. I, I mean, it is r r ridiculous how lucky I have been. I mean, we went into tillage uh, in Jamestown about two years ago, partly because we've been putting the cattle on peat uh, in our uh, operation for the last five or ten years. So we said we needed straw for the next number of years. So I've, uh, we've expanded. We bought about 700 acres of tillage land in the last uh, three years. We've expanded into uh, tillage, mainly because I, need, I wanted the straw for the cattle. So we now have uh, spring and winter barley, spring and winter wheat. Um, and we're also we're using whole crop to kind of supplement their diet. Um, and I think our timing has been somewhat fortuitous. And, and you are aware, of course, that agriculture is another sector, along with the aviation sector, that must play its part in tackling climate change. So do you feel, is this, is this part of what you are doing? I mean, uh, it is part of what we're doing. We're trying to become more self-sustainable. Like, you know, I now have a very large herd of, um, of cows. We produce a lot of natural fertiliser each year. And we're trying to cut down the amount of fertiliser we, we buy in and use more in slurry uh, for fertiliser. I mean, I think though agriculture is, you know, unfairly... I think one of the learnings that's coming out of the Ukrainian invasion is going to be a much greater, I think, focus in Europe on food security and, and uh, being independent both on, for energy and for food. And I think that's not a bad rebalancing. There's far too much criticism of agriculture. Uh, really, what agriculture is not the cause of global warming. You know, fossil fuels are. Um, and I do think we need to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels. But the idea that we go around targeting agriculture are somehow reducing our the world's ability to produce food if you take the you know ukrainian production out of uh, the world supplies for the next year or two we're facing dramatically higher food prices and the at the start and end of every civilization will be food security and food independence um and you know i think that must come some center stage in the next couple of years so i'm much more optimistic about agriculture and I think as a sector, we need to get up off our knees and stop apologising for what we do. In Ireland, we produce extensive food, we do it very well, and we should stop apologising to the environmentalists for it. I know, but I mean, the EPA reports on water quality are an example of um, how agriculture absolutely needs to clean up its act and that we can continue with business as usual. And I think there's an acceptance among farmers uh, I, I, that I that is absolutely. the case. You know, but you look at what farmers have done in the last 10, 20 years, you know. We're improving fencing. You know, there's very few farmers now allow their cattle to drink in streams and rivers anymore, and reps has played a large part in that too. Uh, you know, so the EU deserves credit for that. Your your Jigginstown sale has gone online over the last couple of years. I'm yeah. sure you've missed the interaction. It's happening next Saturday in um, at at the Fenner Farm. Um, are you, are you looking forward to, I suppose, welcoming people back once again? No, Will I, they come back? I, I think we're very excited. You know, we had the choice. I mean, it, it has gone very well online for the last two years. We had the choice of doing it online again. But actually, I think that Joe O'Mahony, the team, even though it means a lot of extra work, we like putting on the kind of sale. I think it gives us a chance to display all the cattle. People come along and see the stock bulls, the, uh, the, the, some of the better cows we have there. But it also gives a kind of an occasion a day out. Um, and I think with this year, what we're trying to do is have this sale both online, but in person as well. Um, and we are must say, looking forward to inviting people back in, say, come and have a look at the, at the herd and what we're doing. And hopefully it will be as successful as it was in previous years. Most of our bulls are sold to dairy men who want, you know, four or five star Angus bull who's easy calving on their dairy herd but you know but i think that the, the great advantage of the angus is that in recent years we have the success of the certified angus beef program there's now significant premiums there for angus beef and i think that has been a tremendous a tremendous success by the angus breeds themselves is there more interest in pedigree breeding there is um but you know one can't exist without the other we need to provide you know high quality stock breeding animals that are four and five star that support both the dairy customer but also uh, the pedigree breeder as well so this year we said we i think we have about 30 bulls and about 20 uh, heifers but half the heifers are in calf and the great thing is about 80 percent of the bulls and the heifers are all four and five stars well later today you're the great love of course horse racing the ancient grand national i see you've half a dozen maybe horses running in it or there there six i hope yeah, yeah. 
And um, Delta work, you were cursing a month ago, but I'm sure um, your attitude towards Delta will change later today. Ah, like, you know, we, I thought it was just a tragedy in Cheltenham. You know, it would have been such a fairy tale if Tiger Roll had managed to be to, to win. If the rain hadn't come on Wednesday, I think he'd have won. In retrospect, he'd have won by half the track. Uh, but the rain came, and he's just not the same horse on, on wet ground. But uh, I think for a last run of his career, he gave us all a fantastic day. It was a great occasion in Cheltenham. Delta Work won the race, so we're always happy to have a win in Cheltenham. Um, he goes, though, to Aintree, but he's but the second or third top weight. And, you know, the top weights don't win the Grand National anymore. Uh, it'll be won by some horse low down the weights. Uh, and of mine, Death Duty has just scraped in on bottom weight. He's 11 years old. I think he has an outstanding chance. And he's uh, the good news, he's about 25 or 33 to 1. And if I was having a bet today, I'd be betting death duty. So Michael O'Leary there with his tip for today's Entry Grand National. If it doesn't come up trumps, you can take it up with him himself at uh, the Jiggenstown Angus Sale taking place at the Fenner Farm outside Mullingar next Saturday, 11.30 a.m.